Duke owns the quarry, Duke sets the price for each zone. So, it could be a dollar a piece. The price going up over time is just a bit there. Yeah. yeah. I think that they're trying to make sure that Paul Matras, his role is sort of yeah. as executive vice president, is trying to judiciously use it in a way that's appropriate. Right. right. So, like, as you can see, this building here only right. has it in the lower half. Right. And the rest is free cash. Yeah. It's an intentional decision to say, you know, I'm going to use it all up. Right. But, no, yeah.
So you are now unmuted, except that I've got you muted here. And let me just remind myself you're on the roll. Perfect. All right. Hey Ben. Good. Good to see you. What are you up to? I'm uh, in Atlanta doing commercial lending and also some real estate work. They call it dirt work. I guess they for what? Uh, for a boutique firm called Kitchen Skelly Games. Okay. It's a smaller firm. Dirt.
Karsh Alumni Center here at Duke, but also welcoming um, all the alumni that are watching the live stream. We have more than 100 alumni um, doing this. Uh, this time is the first time we are broadcasting a lecture online, so welcome to all of you who are watching. Um, so this is part of the professor series to um, basically go, um, for the, there are um, certain Duke Law professors who are going around the country um, talking about their really interesting work and um, connecting with alumni. So Professor Buell just came back from Charlotte, um, but for today we are uh, live in Durham on Friday afternoon live. So um, Professor Buell's um, specialty area is white collar crimes and um, you know um, corporate crimes he's going to tell you a lot more about that um, so he had been a professor he had been obviously and he's been teaching uh, around the country he had clerked um, for the district courts he had uh, been a prosecutor and um, you know and worked in law firms so he really had a very um, fulsome um, career in, uh, encompassing a lot of different areas and um, hence I think you know a lot of perspectives from um, from you know different angles, so um, this is going to be a super treat. I'm really hoping that some of the stories that you're going to tell and everything made it into motion picture sometimes because this is my favorite area of the plot line. So, um, without uh, further ado, I'm just going to uh, welcome Professor Bill for this uh, lecture. Enjoy. Thanks. Hi everybody. Um, thanks a lot for coming. Um, it's a treat to have this audience. Um, and I don't really know my audience that well. I know some of you, but uh, I always, uh, it's like when I was giving this talk in Charlotte on Wednesday, I had some bankers in the room. I had some lawyers who don't know anything about criminal law. And then I found out afterwards that I had the leading defense attorney in Charlotte and the former US attorney in Raleigh sitting in my audience. Um, I'm glad I didn't know that till afterwards or I would have been more nervous about whether I was getting things right. Um, the, the catering, which is delicious today, has come in the noisiest piece of plastic <laughs> that you could possibly wrap a sandwich in. So I think it would be good if we all just removed the noisy plastic right now for the benefit of our, um, our, our audience that may be listening online. And my guess is that this brand new, high-tech, beautiful space has extremely good microphones um, that are picking up all of the, the yeah, okay, so rapper noise, rapper noise, rapper noise. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk to you today about fraud. Um, this is a big part of my scholarship, has been a big part of my scholarship. It's also a major co component of my corporate crime course here at Duke Law School. I, I don't see anybody, I think, here who took the class. So that's good, because some of this repeats a little bit what we talk about in class. But the version I'm going to give of this today is not you know, the kind of law review article version. This is a quick and breezy tour through some famous and some not so famous but interesting cases. And I want to um, see if I can get you to agree with me by the end of this that um, fraud is really interesting and it's a lot of fun. And it's not nearly as simple as most people think. So what would you lawyers say if you got asked all of a sudden to answer like a bar exam question. <clears throat> what is the law of fraud? What is the black letter law of fraud? Like what does a prosecutor have to prove? And by the way, I'm asking for participation today. Um, what does a prosecutor have to prove to convict somebody of fraud? I know there's at least one defense lawyer in the room, but she just got done uh, litigating a death penalty case and we do not impose the death penalty for fraud in the United States at least not yet, um, although it's unclear whether, in fact, in China you can get the death penalty for fraud. Um, someone said something. Intent. Intent to what? Intent to deceive. Good. So deception is clearly a uh, very important concept in the law of fraud. What do we mean when we say deceive? What does it mean for a person to deceive another person? If you wanted to just throw out kind of a working definition of deception, what would it be? The, okay, and, and but what do you need for there to be deception? For reasonable reliance. Well, you might also need that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But for for even outside the law, just you know, for you to deceive me, what what are you doing to me? 
Well, you don't have to lie, right? Tricking, lying. I mean, what you're really doing is you're causing me to form a belief which is contrary to the true facts, right? Now, you don't have to lie to make, I mean, lying is the most common way of deceiving, but you don't have to lie. There are lots of ways to get people to believe things that are not true, right, without actually making a false statement. In fact, the really good frauds, the clever ones, usually are figured out in a way that, you know, the person committing it doesn't actually have to lie. Um, but to get the, back to the, the point of intent, that's critical in the criminal law, right? Because uh, in the criminal law, deception alone is not enough, right? If you mistakenly t give somebody a false belief because you thought something was true that wasn't, you got someone else to believe it too, that's not fraud, even though that person may have been deceived, because you didn't have the intent to deceive. You weren't out to deceive. So the intent part is kind of an extra requirement for a crime, right? Um, but it's also the thing that shows us that uh, for, for a, a, a crime, what's really, you know, it all comes down to is the, uh, the scheme or the effort to deceive. It doesn't actually have to work, right? Because you all probably remember from your first year criminal law classes that we have some general concepts in criminal law, like attempt, where the criminal law uh, at least allows prosecutors and police to intervene when people are in the process of trying to commit crimes without having to show that they actually succeeded or completed the offense. Now, most big ticket frauds that you see prosecuted in courts in the US now are going to involve some level of success, right? Uh, somebody's going to be out money, or usually the prosecutors and the police aren't going to get interested in the case. But not necessarily, and it's certainly not legally required, right? So if we were going to say, what are the black letter elements of fraud? We might say, well, we need some kind of a scheme to defraud, right? That's what the law would say. Um, but of course, that's question begging. What is a scheme to defraud? We need to know what fraud is to know what a scheme to defraud is, right? And what we, I think, have worked out so far is we need some story in which we have a perpetrator and a victim and some deception, right? A is attempting to deceive B intentionally, and we have a scheme to defraud. Now, we also have this requirement that lots of you know from lots of areas of law of materiality which does apply in the criminal law. And it's just a way of kind of carving out the low-level nonsense that doesn't really matter, right? So uh, it's got to be deception about something that's important to somebody's decision. Usually in the fraud context, it's a decision that has something to do with buying some kind of a product, forking over money for something. And it's got to be material, the deception. And then somebody already mentioned we got the mental state part, which is always critical in criminal law, the intent to defraud. Now, the one thing I would add to this, and I think it's kind of implicit in what we've said so far, is a fraud has to be after something, right? So the example I kind of give is, you know, if I lie my way into a fancy party by claiming to be on the list at the door so I can get into the party and network with, like, you know, important people, well, we wouldn't really prosecute that as a fraud case because this object of value would just be too minor or even intangible there to count as something that we would say is a fraud. So there are actually lots of instances, I think, in social relations where people deceive each other in order to accomplish something. But it, the, the thing they're trying to accomplish is something relational or social. It's not a thing of value, right? But it's also important to understand that the law of fraud doesn't require the thing to be money or even property. There are fraud theories that have to do with things like legal claims, legal rights, um, other things that are tang you know, tangible and intangible but substantial that a fraud can, can be out to deprive somebody of, and that would count as a, as a criminal fraud. Now, these, we're talking about criminal f crimes today. We're not talking about civil lawsuits. Many of you may be involved in litigating fraud cases. In criminal law, we actually don't need to prove reliance because of the whole attempt concept, right? If the victim kind of goes, not so sure here, and runs to the FBI and goes, hey, this guy's doing this, and I'm not really sure you know, whether it's legit, and then they investigate it, it turns out to be a fraud scheme, well, the victim never relied. But we'd still have a, a criminally prosecutable fraud. Um, and then uh, uh, entailed within that, of course, is that no prosecutor, unlike a plaintiff in a fraud case, doesn't have to prove that actual uh, damages or loss were incurred or that the fraud succeeded.
Okay, so there's a pretty good working definition of black, the black letter law of fraud. That might not be exactly the way a court would state it if you went to look up the law of fraud in North Carolina on Westlaw or something like that, but that's basically the conceptual framework that I teach. So the rest of my talk is designed to show you that this is essentially useless when it comes to uh, figuring out whether you've actually got a criminal fraud. Um, and I shouldn't say useless because it's really a floor. I mean, you know, you get, I tell my students, start any analysis of a fraud case with these building blocks and make sure you've got some kind of a story you can tell that fits within this, but that's not gonna tell you whether what you've got in any kind of sophisticated context is actually a fraud. So let's start with an easy case, right? Ponzi schemes, right? So on the left, Charles Ponzi, after whom these frauds were named. On the right, Bernard Madoff, who committed the largest Ponzi scheme in human history. Now, these cases are sort of famous examples of fraud, right? A lot of times, actually, if you ask people, what's a fraud? They would say, oh, a Ponzi schemes, right? Well, give me an example. Oh, Madoff, okay. Uh, why was Madoff, what Madoff did a fraud? Where's the deception, uh, the scheme to defraud? Anybody? Was he falsifying his rate of return and what was said as He was falsifying his investment scheme. Like, there was some actual investment yeah. scheme, which is what he was making investment scheme. So this was just the securities um, uh, version of uh, claiming uh, that to sell a product that didn't exist, right? Um, you know, uh, would you like to buy the Brooklyn Bridge? Um, here's the contract, you know, and then you run away with the money and the person finds out they don't actually own the Brooklyn Bridge, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, what, you know, the famous old, I, you know, I've got a bridge in New York to sell you if you, you know. So this is a uh, only somewhat more sophisticated version of that in that it involves securities and there's a certain, at least to a lot of um, naive investors, there's a kind of opaqueness about that market and a, a sense of like, well, I don't know how to tell whether they're really there, and if he gives me a piece of paper that says they're there, then I guess they are. And he took advantage of a lot of um, sort of remarkable levels of kind of trust, and, 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 um, and no one was checking his work. Um, this was, in part, the Madoff case was um, what, what's known as an affinity fraud, because a lot of the uh, victims that were sucked into the Ponzi scheme were people he knew through um, charitable and religious activities in New York. So there was a kind of relationship there already where people thought they should trust the guy, and he seemed really legit. Turned out, you know, his auditor was some fly-by-night guy who worked out of a strip mall in, like, Westchester County. You know, I mean, anybody who actually had said to Madoff, like, I want to see the underlying stuff, would have figured this out. Um, but they didn't, right? But as a, a, a case of fraud, it's really simple and really straightforward. I actually don't even teach the Madoff case, even though it's probably like the most famous white collar crime that's come along in the last 30 years. There's nothing really interesting to talk about. It's very interesting from a psychology perspective, right? The psychology of Madoff is very interesting, and the psychology of his victims is very interesting, but the law part is not. Um, all right, so here's Bernard, uh, sorry, yeah, Bernard Ebers, right? Yeah, Bernie Evers. It's also a Bernard. I never put that together. So uh, WorldCom uh, was, at the time, in the early 2000s, the largest bankruptcy in US history, right? Now, when we get into accounting fraud, things get a little more complicated than like in the Madoff case, right? So who's being deceived? Who's the perpetrator? What's the deception? Um, you know, these are securities being sold on the New York Stock Exchange on the secondary market, and the buyers and sellers of those securities are being misled about the true value of the company. How are they being misled? Well, because the company's financial statements have numbers in them that are false. I mean, this is a lying case. Um, and it's actually, as you know, there's a little bit you have to understand about SEC regulation and the disclosure regime and how stock markets work to understand where the opportunity is to commit fraud here but it's a pretty uh, basic kind of fraud. I mean, it's just lying about the value of a product you have. It's actually not that different from the Madoff case in that in a sense. Although WorldCom, which was formerly the MCI company, um, did have a product, did have a real product. The problem at WorldCom, which was, you know, it's a classic story that you see in accounting fraud cases, was that the company expanded very quickly in the late 90s, early 2000s during the first tech boom, and it was telling a story of, rapid growth of earnings quarter on quarter, and the stock price was going like this, and it was all a great story. And then uh, the market kind of turned against them. There was you know, the tech, the first tech bubble kind of deflated, and they didn't have the revenues anymore that they you know, expected to continue with. And instead of saying, you know, 
not so good, things have turned against us and taking a hit to the stock price, they started figuring out how to mess around with their accounting to keep the story going. Um, and, and the messing around with the accounting part, you really don't have to understand much of anything about accounting to understand how it worked. They just took a billion dollars that they had been uh, booking as an expense and um, switched it over to become a capital expenditure so that they could put it in a different place and, and, and depreciate um, the, the amount rather than taking it all at once as an expense. This had a major impact on the bottom line. You know, investors look at financial statements, they want to know how much is the company making and how much is it spending, right? Uh, and this switch from sort of the left pocket to the right of that billion dollars was a way of uh, avoiding having to tell a worsening story about the uh, relationship between um, what was coming in and what was going out. Uh, the, the, this was going out money, and the, and the money had to do with um, leasing costs that the company was paying for uh, broadband access. So they were selling broadband access, but they didn't own a lot of the broadband. A lot of the broadband they were leasing from other companies, they had been treating that as an expense, like the sandwiches or the coffee for the employees. And then they said, oh no, it's a, we're going to start uh, treating these leasing costs as a capital expenditure, um, like an investment, right? And then we can uh, book it uh, differently. And the key was, uh, to the fraud was that they hid that, right? I mean, it would have been it would have been a fraud if Madoff had said to the shareholders, "Just so you know, we're going to move the billion from here over to here. We've decided it's more appropriately treated as a capital expense. Talk to our accountants and so forth." When Madoff got to trial, he said to the judge, "Look, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I thought." You know, I thought there was an argument that generally accepted accounting principles gap. Let, you know, there was kind of a debate. Do these leasing costs belong in expenses or capital expenditure? And the account said, well, you could treat it. You, there's an argument you could treat it as capital expenditure. And so uh, I should have gotten a jury instruction that said, if you believe uh, that um, gap allowed this, you must acquit because he couldn't have had the intent to defraud. And the Second Circuit, when it affirmed his conviction, said, no, doesn't work that way. Uh, jury certainly can be told that his belief in good faith about what Gap allowed is relevant to whether he had the intent to commit fraud. But the ultimate issue is, uh, was he deceiving the shareholders and did he know it? And was that his intent? Um, and if he's uh, exploiting a, a, a nuance and gap to kind of move the money from A to B and hide the fact that he's moving it from A to B, he can still have the intent to defraud, even if he thinks, I've got an argument under gap. So OK, a little bit more complicated, because you have to talk a little bit about accounting, but not in a way that, I mean, I can't talk in a sophisticated way about accounting. And I think I was able to explain that. So all right, well, now we get to these guys, right? So this is calculus to WorldCom's algebra. Um, it I would take me the rest of the day to explain to you how Enron exploited the accounting rules to uh, ultimately create a misleading picture of uh, the company's finances. So the concept of the fraud is exactly the same, right? It's how do we deceive buyers and sellers in the secondary market about the true value of the company so that our stock stays up. And by the way, in both the Enron case and the WorldCom case, uh, the CEOs, Ebers, and in this case, Kenneth Lay, their own holdings of the company stock were 100% leveraged. So they had taken all of their Enron or WorldCom stock, and they had used it to, uh, on the advice of their financial advisors, to take out um, margin loans from banks, which they then used the proceeds of to invest in uh, other assets, uh, illiquid assets, things like paint, paintings, boats, houses, stuff like that. Um, this was considered to be a way to diversify without actually dumping your company stock and fear that it would be if I dump all my Enron or WorldCom stock, it's going to send a signal to the market that I don't believe in the company. Um, okay, well then just um, leverage it. Don't sell it, leverage it. Well, the problem with that is as soon as the stock price starts going down, if you're 100% leveraged as they both were, now you start getting margin calls from the banks and you have a personal, you're not just trying to keep the stock price up because it looks good for you and looks good for the company, you're trying to keep the stock price up because you're in trouble. Um, you know, your, 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 your loans are being called in. So uh, these guys, with the help of a very, very sophisticated in-house uh, CFO operation and in-house accounting operation, um, uh, constructed a web of sort of really elaborate ways to kind of exploit the accounting regime to uh, avoid, again, telling a, uh, the, the shareholders during the year uh, 2001 
some bad news about the fact that a bunch of businesses that the company had expanded into were not doing well. Again, somewhat as a result of the fact that they got caught in kind of the deflation of the initial tech boom. Um, it was an energy company, but they had tried to expand into a whole bunch of areas, including actually broadband. Um, so uh, one of the things that's interesting about Enron, though, that's, that's widely misunderstood, is that um, only about, I mean, Enron's business model was actually financial engineering. They, they were a legacy gas, natural gas pipeline company. Um, they still had those pipelines. Those were real assets, that was, but that was a much smaller company. They had expanded into something that was, you know, Fortune 5, cover of you know, the, all the magazines, America's most admired company, and on and so forth, on a bunch of moves into areas that weren't working out. And, um, uh, and that was their problem. And it turns out that only about 20%, say, of their financial engineering was provably criminal. Um, about 80% of it uh, was aggressive, but there wasn't a rule that said you couldn't, and the accountants and the lawyers had said, we can't find a rule that says you can't. And they never asked Vincent and Elkins, their lawyers, or even really Arthur Anderson, their outside auditor, um, well, but what do you guys think? I mean, should we do this? I mean, the, the, the relationship with the professional advisors was always just, we want to know where the line is, and we only want to know if we're clearly across it. Um, so a lot of the transactions, including um, uh, some very large transactions with Citibank and Chase that would take too long for me to explain, but are um, quite similar to some of the things that the big banks were doing uh, late in the financial crisis, uh, right, right before the financial crisis, to avoid having to write down the um, value of their mortgage-backed securities. Uh, those transactions were approved by auditors and lawyers in a way that would make, make it um, impossible for, a pro even though in, there was an argument that the effect of these transactions was to be uh, misleading the market about um, the, the company's de debt situation, it was impossible to prove that they had the intent to defraud because they'd be able to say, you know, this is complicated. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I tell my people, get creative, go to the line, bring me solutions. And I was told this worked or it was OK. Um, so, uh, so Enron is a. Um, a case that sort of, you can see how accounting fraud can start to shade into this problem of, you know, when do you really have a deception? And more particularly, when do you actually have the intent to deceive? Uh, particularly in the, the, the context of sophisticated uh, modern financial markets. Um, and there's also an interesting psychology story in these cases. I mean, why commit the fraud if the company's going to, you know, I mean, these, these frauds come out because the, both these companies went bankrupt. They didn't work. You know, but I think there's always a belief. You know, if I can get through this quarter, I get through the next quarter, things will turn in my favor. Uh, you know, not only will no one ever find out, you know, what we did, but it's better for the shareholders. They'll all be better off in the end. Um, OK, so let's go simple again. And we'll talk a little bit more about sort of different contexts, right? So in the, on the used car lot, why is it the case, as I think we, most of us would agree, that if you go to buy a used car, it turns out afterwards that the dealer rolled back the odometer so that you bought a car thinking it had 50,000 miles on it, really had 100,000? That's a fraud, right? If you buy a car in the used car lot and you find out later that the paint job had, uh, you know, caused you to not be able to see that there was some pretty bad rust. Um, it's not really a fraud, right? Why not? If you went running to a prosecutor with the paint job case and you said, I want this guy prosecuted for fraud. He sold me a used car, and it turned out that underneath the fresh paint job, the thing was all rusted out. He paints all the cars. That's what you do when you're selling used cars. You put it, well, not this guy. He's selling you know, junk. But the, the, the nice used car dealers will put a fresh coat of paint on the car, especially the old ones. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I certainly would 
you know, if, if I bought a car thinking it wasn't all rusted out, I'd, be, I'd feel like if I knew the, that it had been rusty, I wouldn't have bought it. That's the definition of materiality. Yeah. <laughs> What if we can prove somehow from you know, his emails or something that he knows, he knew about the rust? I didn't say he couldn't prove it, I said it's hard. Yeah, so, but I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna say, let's assume, I think even if we say we can prove it, we still go, oh, I'm not sure it's a fraud. Yeah. Maybe he never represented that the car is not rusty, but the odometer is a representation of how many miles are on Okay, so there might be an aspect to the odometer case where there actually is a false statement, and the rust case, is more of a didn't tell case, right? Now you said earlier, you know, you need a false statement or you need some disclosure when there's a duty to disclose, right? So how do we figure out whether there's a duty to disclose? You go, oh, I love that word duty. I remember that from law school and from bar exams and stuff. You look it up. Well, not really here. I mean, you gotta, what's, how do we decide whether there's a duty? Relationship of trust? Yeah. Yeah, is this a relationship of trust? No. no, definitely not, definitely not. I mean, the used car lot is the classic caveat emptor environment, right? But why do we say that, right? Because we just do. I mean, that, that's just, that's this market. That has kind of always been this market. Everybody knows that's this market, or at least you're expected to know that that's this market if you want to be a functioning market participant in modern American capitalist society. This market, a little different. These guys have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. Now we can just parrot the words fiduciary duty and that sounds fancy and sounds like it solves the problem, but we need to understand that that's the, that's the, the rule that results from the reasoning. It's not the reasoning itself, right? The reasoning itself is, that these people should have a duty because of what we've decided about the nature of the market for selling securities and the relationship between the buyer and the seller. Now there's an information disparity between buyer and seller here that's pretty substantial and that may be part of why we, we say these guys have a kind of duty of disclosure. A lot of the Enron case you know, wasn't just lies, it was you know, not disclosing, right? I mean, the WorldCom case, is kind of a non-disclosure case, right? The real problem there is that he didn't tell that he had switched the treatment of that billion dollars over, right? So uh, that's because as a matter of, of market custom and social norms, we have decided that this is a market in which a certain kind of disclosure is required, and this is a market in which, you know, when you got a car you don't like, smallest violin in the world is playing for you, you know, uh, you ought to know how to buy used cars. Whereas this market is, you know, outrage all over the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and every other paper in this country. You know, people practically rioting in the streets in Houston, Texas over these employees who all, you know, got hurt so badly and the little old lady with her, you know, investment fund and stuff. And, we, and by the way, nobody said after Enron, uh, except some academics, um, you know what, those people really ought to have been diversified. If you're wiped out because of the Enron bankruptcy, it's because you put all your money in Enron, that was not smart. Yeah, but the, the, the CEO kept telling the employees, you know, I have, I'm fully invested in Enron, totally margined too, but you know, didn't sell that part, but I'm fully invested in Enron, I own all this Enron stock, I'm buying more Enron stock and you should too. You should put your um, retirement fund in Enron stock. And then, of course, they were outraged when it turned out later that that was a really bad decision, which they were not required uh, to do. All right, suppose there's a little old lady. She goes to church every Sunday. At church one Sunday, she meets a gentleman. They're chatting, they hit it off. Uh, she asks him over uh, for a cup of tea after church to continue the chat. And while they're sitting in her living room, he notices this antique chest of drawers sitting over on the side of the room. And he says, oh, that's a lovely piece. And she says, oh, I can't stand that thing. I don't use it anymore. I'm bumping it into to it all the time. Uh, I'd love uh, to get it out of here. And he says, oh, really? Oh, I'd love to have it. I'll take it off your hands for $100. And I'll move it for you. And she says, great. They do the deal. 
Turns out he's an antique dealer. The next day, he sells it on the antique market for $10,000. When he looked at it, he thought it was worth about 10. Fraud? Why isn't this a fraud? Why not? OK, so the first thing we have to say is he didn't lie, right? He didn't lie. Um, you, know, you could try to construct a really lawyery argument about like, well, but when he says 100, I'll give you 100 bucks, that's a representation that he thinks it's worth 100. But that, the law of fraud doesn't do that. I mean, just because you name a price you know, and you think your price is, is not what the thing's really worth, you're not lying. That's negotiation, right? And we'll come back to negotiation in a minute. Um, so he doesn't lie. So the issue has to be, does he have to tell her? Does he have to tell her what? He has superior knowledge to her about the value. Right. Either, either that he is an expert or that he thinks it's worth $10,000 or both. He doesn't tell her those things. For, uh, you know, she has been deceived, I think. Um, the way the whole thing goes down probably makes her think it's worth about 100 bucks, right? And he kind of he doesn't want her to know what it's really worth. So she has kind of been deceived. It's certainly material. She's out money. I mean, we have all the uh, building blocks here. He's, he's got a clear objective to, to, to make money off the deception. It looks like it fills all the elements of fraud. But it's not a fraud, because what is the relationship here? You know, it's not quite this, but it's nowhere near that. And if you want to make it more like this than that, you have to say something about little old ladies and people they meet at church, and it just doesn't, you know, or antique dealers who have a duty to the world, right? Um, uh, no, it doesn't make any sense at all, right? Why doesn't it make sense? Not because of anything we can look up on Westlaw. It's just our common sense. It's what we know about the world, right? Uh, markets, the point I'm trying to drive home and probably will have driven home ad nauseum by the time we're done, markets are what determines what fraud is as much as the law itself. All right, this one, some of you may know, right? So uh, uh, the, the, the very unlucky students who graduated from law school in the 2005 to 2009 window, some of them may be here in the room, um, uh, the ones that graduated from Duke in that window were, were, uh, were less unlucky than, than those who graduated from a lot of other schools. Um, and uh, there are a couple of examples of this kind of case, but the one I'm going to talk about is about students who enrolled at New York Law School, not to be confused with NYU, my alma mater, um, in this window, uh, who ended up suing New York Law School when their employment prospects were you know, not great um, afterwards, saying that they had been defrauded into attending New York Law School by New York Law School's provision of misleading employment data. Now, the data that was published, as, as most of you probably know now, post-financial crisis, the ABA jumped in and decided to regulate this, right? So it's, it's kind of like the whole SEC disclosure thing that you have in the accounting fraud example didn't exist for law schools. Now it does, right? So imagine what you could do with your financial statements if you were a public company and there was no Securities and Exchange Commission and no SEC regulation. It was just, you know, you get to tell the market whatever you want about your business. Now, there's actually some economists who think that would be fine because all the companies would compete to be the ones with the best disclosure, and you'd, ha you'd want to do good disclosure to get the investors, right? Now, lawyers always kind of laugh. You know, if we were in the economics department here at Duke, the economists would always sit around going, why are you laughing? That's obviously what economic theory would say. Um, so so, uh, so um, no such regulation in the law school space, right? So, so what should we do? Well, New York Law School. Um, they, you know, uh, their, their percentage employed after graduation include all these part-time positions and temporary positions and research assistants who'd been hired by professors at the law school so that they could boost the employment statistic. And none of that was disclosed, right? They just said, you know, 92% employed, right, or whatever. Um, and then there was some monkeying around with kind of mean salary one year after graduation. They didn't include the way they calculated that. They didn't disclose the way they calculated it. And they, they sort of included some stuff and not other stuff, right? OK, so the, the, the students sued, and they said fraud. Now, by this point in the talk, we all know what the analysis needs to be, right? First we got, well, did they get lied to? Well, they tried that, right? But it actually was hard. It was hard to say when you looked at what was on the website that these were false statements, right? They were, 
the law school version of what we are hit with all day long in our lives in this world, which is sales talk, right? Verizon, we have the best signal in the country. Uh, we have the most, you know, they put the map up. We have the most areas of coverage, you know, of any cell company, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, we know that we're not supposed to just take that stuff at face value in an arm's length caveat emptor type sales situation. And the question here became, is this such a situation or is it something different? What do you think the court said? They win or lose? They lost? Yeah, they lost. Um, why did they lose? Well, first of all, prospective students especially have no particularly trusting or special relationship with the institutions that they apply to. Now, you know, we at Duke would never want to say that to our applicants, right? Um, because we're trying to build that trust relationship in part as a way to both get people to want to come to Duke and apply to Duke, but also to start our relationship off on the right foot, you know, if they do come to Duke. Um, but uh, uh, that's not, you know, sort of something you can say is generally true about the market for educational products. And the court said, sorry, no special relationship requiring disclosure here. But the court was obviously bothered by the case because it's not this case. We don't want to say that law schools are like used car lots. You know? So the court added a couple of paragraphs. This was a New York State court decision. They added a couple of paragraphs at the end of the opinion, basically saying, like, we don't want to be understood as approving anything about being abusive towards vulnerable young people who are trying to figure out how to basically mortgage their future so that they can have a career. Um, you know, bad, unethical behavior here but not fraud. And it was only a civil lawsuit, by the way. A prosecutor, as far as I know, never, never looked at these cases. And then the ABA, as I said, subsequently decided to regulate. Um, let me just see how I'm doing on, on time. Yeah, OK, so I'm going to skip the next example. Um, all right, so now let's go back to the financial markets now that we've developed these concepts a little more and, and start talking about how they might help us decide cases. So. Uh, this is a case out of uh, Chicago in the late 80s. Uh, at the time, the Commodities Futures Exchange in Chicago um, uh, had uh, no rule against insider trading. So uh, there wasn't an actual regulation in place because they just hadn't gotten around to figuring it out. I mean, this was during the time when insider trading in the regular securities market was just starting to get established. Uh, the law of it was just starting to get established by the courts. The first prosecutions were happening in New York. The Commodities Exchange had no, no rule against insider trading. These guys were commodities brokers, and they had a client who was, in, you know, they were, was putting together a group of people to take a very large um, futures position in, in the silver market. And uh, they decided that since the, they were going to do this deal for the client, and they knew it would move the price, uh, it was a big enough deal to move the price of silver, that they would take some silver positions themselves in advance of the client's deal. And they were prosecuted for defrauding the client. Now, they didn't lie to the client. They just didn't tell the client that they were doing this. And there was no rule that said they couldn't. So uh, the federal prosecutors find out about this. And they prosecute, convict, goes up to the Seventh Circuit. Richard Posner gets the case. And Posner says, well, this is clearly a fraud. Because, why? What do you think Posner said? Why do you think Posner said this was a fraud? Violated the client agreement. Yes. Understanding that confidentiality, they do not misuse their information. Now, now, how does Posner know this? Well, because he's Posner. He knows everything, right? So he just writes this opinion that basically says, look, let me tell you. And one of the reasons I assigned this uh, case in class is because it has this wonderful, it's called the United States versus Dial. Look it up. Posner's such a great writer. He, he's got this wonderful sort of two or three pages at the beginning of the uh, opinion in which he says, you know, hello, folks. We're the Seventh Circuit. We're going to explain this case to you now. But in order to take up the legal issue of whether this is fraud, you need to understand how futures trading works. And he writes a two or three page uh, summary of how this market works, which is one of the best introductions I've ever read to the concept of derivatives. Everybody needs to understand derivatives in our world now. 
You must, right? Uh, we all should have known more about derivatives before the financial crisis. Post-financial crisis, everyone has to understand how, what derivatives are. In a basic model like commodities markets, as opposed to mortgage-backed securities, it's pretty simple. And Posner does a phenomenal job of explaining this, right? So he explains the whole market as a way of explaining what these guys were out to get. And then also to get to the point where he can tell a story and say, OK, so this is the relationship between the broker and the client. And he summarizes the, the relationship between the broker and the client by saying the client has bought candor, right? It isn't that there's some, you know, th th this guy's not a priest or, you know a, 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 you know, a shaman of some sort or some person that just sort of, you know, has some ethical duty that falls down on him from the sky. It's that he is selling professional services in a market in which his clients are buying a particular kind of relationship for which he is being well paid, just like you are as lawyers by your clients. And that is a product that comes with candor. It comes with disclosure. Now, to get this into the concept of fraud, you have to say, OK, well, what's the deception? Right? It's not a lie. It's a non-disclosure. How are the clients deceived? Right? It's not enough, to, I don't think, for fraud to just say, well, fraud is not telling people stuff you're supposed to tell them. Um, because that might be something that professional regulation would, would handle. Right? There's got to be a deception. The concept of the deception here is the clients are doing business with this guy based on the expectation that he will not trade ahead. It's not this guy. That's Charlie Sheen. But uh, you know, that he will not trade ahead of them in a way that is contrary to their interests. Because in theory, the brokers jumping in the market ahead of the clients could move the price and cut down on the profit that the clients are going to get when they put their thing in. So they're assuming that's not happening. If it is happening and they're not being told, they are being deceived by that non-disclosure. Because if they knew, they'd fire the guy. All right, so here comes a case much more recent uh, from the New York Stock Exchange. This is not Mr. Finnerty, who was the defendant, but he's one of these guys. The blue coat guys on the New York Stock Exchange, they're called specialists. They're market makers. They stand on the, on the floor of the exchange, and they match buy, buy and sell orders. And there are, each of these specialist firms are assigned through a process, I don't know how it works, certain securities. So in the Finnerty case, I think they were, um, they were the specialist for uh, General Electric stock and a couple of other really you know, blue chip kind of stocks. And they engaged in something called interpositioning which is basically, you know, you got a seller. Seller says, I'll, um, I'll, I'll sell at 50. And uh, you're looking for a buyer who will buy at that price, and you don't have one. So then the specialist firm says, we'll buy it at 50 and hold it till we find the buyer. And then by the time they find a buyer, it's actually 51. And the specialist firm got a buck per share. OK, now here's the interesting thing. The New York Stock Exchange rules both prohibit and allow this, right? They prohibit it if there's a buyer standing right there. You're not allowed to go, um, don't see any buyers, but we'll hold it for you. If there's a buyer right there, you're just the market maker, and you've got to get buyer and seller together and do the deal. But if there's no buyer there, we want market liquidity, says the New York Stock Exchange. We want sellers to be able to sell. So specialist firms are allowed to buy and hold until they find a buyer. They're allowed to interposition. Well, the government was able to prove, through mechanisms I don't fully understand, that Mr. Finnerty was doing lots of interpositioning when there were buyers right there. Got prosecuted for fraud. Now, similar theory to this dial case, right? It's like. You're stepping in, you know, in between the client and the client's deal to take a piece. But in this case, the Second Circuit said, no fraud. Now, why is this not a fraud and Dial is a fraud? I mean, the, the, the clever lawyer answer is because there are circuit splits and the Seventh Circuit in the Second Circuit just saw the case differently. But I try to get the students to understand how you could actually reconcile the cases. Right? And if you read the Finnerty case, what the Second Circuit says is, the government never brought in a client of these specialist firms to say, A, I expect them not to be doing it. Their whole argument was just like, well, if the New York Stock Exchange has a rule against it, then the clients expect it's not being done. And if you're doing it, that's, that's defrauding the client. Well, 
the court was sort of like, it would have been nice to have at least one person come in and say, yeah, that's what we expect. And if I knew these guys were interpositioning when they're not allowed to, I wouldn't deal with that firm anymore. And they had no such evidence, right? The other thing is, this is not a broker-client relationship. These guys are market makers. I mean, this is more like going down to the diamond dealer in Manhattan or whatever and uh, trying to you know, buy some antique diamond and have the diamond dealer match you with a you know, match buyer and seller. You don't expect to have, you know, and people want to say, oh, they're, but they're specialists on the New York Stock Exchange. They work, they're regulated by NYSE rules. So they have all these special duties. Okay, but wait a minute, let's talk about the market. What is the market? What is the function of these individuals in the market? And it turns out they're not really brokers. They don't have that kind of relationship. The government was at least not able to prove that in Richard Posner's words, the individuals dealing with these specialist firms expect that they have bought candor. All right, here's one that will interest you a lot. So this is uh, early in the financial crisis. There's a bank in Wisconsin called Anchor Bank that, like a lot of banks at that time, uh, was having liquidity issues and was worried about its, uh, its um, uh, viability going forward. So this guy, David Weimer, was a vice president at that bank. And they told him, they said, hey, Weimer, we have this uh, commercial real estate development in Texas in which we own a very large uh, a portion of the interest. Um, let's see if we can get out of that for some cash. Go sell the, the real estate development in Texas. So Weimer goes down to Texas. He starts looking for buyers. And he finds a buyer. And Weimer, this is some, you know, it was a, this deal was Weimer's baby. He'd been involved in this thing all along. He knew a lot about it. He was the guy at the bank who knew the most about this, this investment. He finds a buyer. At some point in the discussions with the buyer, he says to the buyer, um, you know, uh, this is going to go a lot better in the future if you keep me involved. Um, how about I stay involved? And it's unclear sort of how that conversation really got started and how it developed. But uh, at some point, Weimar goes back to the board at Anchor Bank and he says, I got a buyer. It's a great price, but they have one condition, one very important condition. They want me to stay involved in the project post-sale, um, and they're willing to pay a 4% commission to me uh, for my personal services going forward, a 4% of the deal. And the board goes, hmm, well, we sure want to sell this thing. Uh, lawyers, what, uh, what do you think? Well, there's a conflict of interest here, but you can waive it um, if you want to to get the deal done. All right, all in favor of waiving the conflict of interest, I waive the conflict. The deal goes forward. Somehow, you know, somebody at the bank must have found out more about the fact that Weimert had sort of, it was kind of his idea in the first place. Um, and they got mad and took it to the prosecutors. And they prosecuted him, I think, in, uh, in the US Attorney's Office somewhere in Wisconsin. It ended up, in another case, end up in the Seventh Circuit. Uh, now, the theory of the case was that Weimert had defrauded his, his employer, the board, the bank, right, uh, out of that 4% commission. Um, the Seventh Circuit said, no, it's not a crime. Now, he didn't lie, but he also didn't tell the board a lot about what went on. And he's the darn vice president of the bank talking to his board of directors. So we wouldn't probably have too hard of a time telling a story there about there being some kind of disclosure obligation. Here's what the court said about why this wasn't a fraud. It's not a fraud to lie in negotiations. Weimar, even if he was lying about the extent to which the buyer uh, was going to walk away without his involvement in the deal, it was just negotiating. He was moving between buyer and seller as kind of the middleman and making representations about people's walkaway positions. We lie about our walkaway positions in, in negotiations all the time. Now, we don't call it lying. We call it negotiating. But you know, my guess is over at the law school, we're teaching the students how to do this in the negotiation class, right? I won't take less than $10,000. And then you know your walkaway number is eight, right? I mean, that's actually a false statement. It's designed to deceive. Um, you're trying to gain something from the deception. It seems to fit all the black letter elements of fraud. But we all go, oh, it's not a fraud. It's negotiation. Now, the, this, I can't remember who the judge was in this case. But he basically said, look, here's the analogy. If Weimar was, going to the, uh, was up for renewal, um, and he went to the compensation committee of his board, and he said, if you don't give me you know, a, a, at least a 20% raise, I'm going over to you know, 
Anchor Bank's competitor. And uh, he wasn't really prepared to walk away. It's just like he was negotiating with the bank over his own comp. But he wasn't, yeah. he wasn't negotiating for the bank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, it's like if he had told the buyer, look, the bank wants me involved. Then they could have said, well, even if that was false, it was a negotiating position or something, right? But no, there's a dissent in the case, and the dissent says, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. You know, it's not like negotiating his own comp. I actually think Weimert's wrongly decided, but it's really interesting about the point that lying in negotiations is not necessarily fraud, right? Criminal. Criminal. Well, but if there's no duty of disclosure in the context, I mean, in theory, that should present a problem for the civil claim as well. <laughs> it wasn't about Weimert's intent. It was about whether there actually is deception when you uh, make stuff up in a negotiation. Um, OK, this guy, uh, Jesse Litvak, was selling uh, mortgage-backed securities post-financial crisis. This is the how do we get rid of the distressed MBS. Um, he was trading for a company called Jeffrey Securities. Uh, and the problem in the distressed MBS market post-crisis, as everybody may remember, because this fed into the whole sort of TARP public policy discussion around this stuff, was how do we figure out what these things are worth? I mean, this was the ultimate example of a market that was kind of making up the price as it went along. They're, the trades are they're trying to figure out. So Litvak told a whole bunch of lies to counterparties in the distressed MBS market. Um, he would say uh, that he had bought the, the securities for a price that was higher than the price he'd actually paid. Um, he would say that he was holding the securities uh, to sell them for a third party when, in fact, they were on his own book. Um, he would sort of tell lies about his own position with the securities as a way of trying to induce the buyer to think that they were getting a good deal, right? And then he'd sell the securities at whatever price the buyer was willing to pay. Now, this case went up to the Second Circuit twice. And ultimately, his conviction was affirmed. But it wasn't an easy case, right? Now, here we don't have to talk about a duty of disclosure, because these were lies, right? But his defense was basically, look, nobody knew what these things were worth. This is like negotiation. We're all kind of trying to get the buyer to, oh, you know, I paid 35. You got to give me at least 36, you know, when he really paid 34. You know, OK, is that really fraud? Um, now, ultimately, a jury thought so. Prosecutor obviously thought so. Jury thought so. The Second Circuit ultimately thought so. Um, but they reversed twice. I think he had to be tried three times or something. They, they reversed twice for error by the trial court in excluding too much of Litvak's expert testimony uh, of people uh, he wanted to call to say, look, this goes on all over the place in the distressed MBS market. Um, and you, know, you might think, well, everyone's doing it. It's never a defense. Well, it's not a defense that everyone else is committing fraud. But it may be a, an argument that you don't have the intent to commit fraud when you're engaging in a kind of gilding of the lily that is standard in the market, right? And the argument is everyone knows this is going on in MBS, so they're not really relying on, you know, or they wouldn't rely on, even though the prosecutor doesn't have to prove reliance, there's kind of this, they wouldn't rely on my representations. Um, now, we don't have time to talk about a Heartland MBS case. This would be like the Goldman Sachs abacus deal, a famous uh, MBS case that was uh, enforced by the SEC but not prosecuted criminally. Um, but it has been my argument in several things I've written since the financial crisis that I think the lion's share of the MBS deals during the financial crisis do not lend themselves at all to a good theory of fraud. Because most of the time, these are non-disclosure cases. And this is over-the-counter securities trading. I mean, when Lloyd Blankfein went before Congress and they started yelling at him about, you have clients, and you're selling these products to these clients. And meanwhile, you know late in the game that Goldman Sachs is taking a massive short position knowing that the music is about to stop. And you didn't tell the clients that. 
and you didn't tell the clients that in fact you thought it was a bad idea for them to be buying these products? The answer is, well, actually, we're kind of like that guy in the over-the-counter MBS market. I mean, they don't want to say that, but it's basically, you know, sophisticated trader of mortgage-backed securities dealing with another sophisticated trader for another large financial institution. And hey, you want to come do due diligence and you want to look at all the underlying mortgages? Come on in. Of course, nobody did, right? Um, again, it's the nature of the market, right? Uh, also don't have time to talk about LIBOR. LIBOR is a longer story, but a very interesting one. I'm getting ready, I think, to write something about it. I mean, here's a case where we have the, wor the most smokingest gun evidence I've ever seen in a white collar case. I mean, there are instant messages where guys at these big banks, like um, uh, uh, the Dutch one now, I've forgotten the name of it, but uh, we're, we're writing things like, we're not the biggest crooks in the market, and we can't make LIBOR too false. Um, you know, written, written down stuff. And this is Tom Hayes, so, uh, Mr. Lord Libor, who worked for UBS. He actually was convicted in the Southwark Crown Court in London and, 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 and did some time. But a number of these people have um, been acquitted. Uh, a number of them uh, acquitted. It turns out to be very actually hard to tell uh, a fraud story in the Libor context. Um, so how do you identify a fraud to wrap up uh, well, you know, back to sort of law, you need some conduct, what criminal law calls actus reus, right? Where do we get that from? Well, the story we have to tell about the deceit is very much one based on whatever that particular market is and whatever the expectations are that individuals bring to that market. And we talked about eight or 10 different kinds of markets in the course of this talk, and I think we could tell a different story about every single one of those markets in terms of what people are coming into that market expecting and, and it's the baseline expectations that are going to determine whether a deception has occurred, right? Then, of course, we have mental state or mens rea in the criminal law. You need that, too. But here, intent to deceive isn't going to be enough. I mean, the car dealer might be intending to deceive when he paints the car, but he doesn't think he's committing a fraud. You'll see in these cases, a lot of times the court will talk about something called consciousness of wrongdoing. You know, it's like, OK, did you mean to deceive the person, but did you also know that that was a wrong kind of deception to be doing? So one of the things that's interesting about that Dial case, the Posner opinion on the Chicago uh, commodities markets, is at the end of the opinion, he says, OK, and also the defendants are complaining that you know, there's kind of a lack of fair notice here, because there was no rule against this on the, on, the, on the market. And here come federal prosecutors with a fraud statute. How are they supposed to know that this you know, could be treated as a crime? Well, it turns out that they created a fake account on the um, uh, brokerage's computer system to conduct these trades, and then they deleted the account as soon as the trades were done. Making their consciousness of wrongdoing uh, mooting basically any argument of, hey, we didn't know this was going to be treated as a fraud. Um, so often in this context, the cover-up kind of is the crime. And this is a really old concept. If there's any bankruptcy lawyers in the room, they're familiar with the concept of badges of fraud, which goes back to the you know, 15th century or something. Um, the sort of how do you tell when a, a debtor who's approaching insolvency is engaged in a fraudulent conveyance when they move assets? Um, and uh, the bottom line is why I love studying white collar crime in general, but particularly fraud, is that these arguments will never be settled because markets will owe, and practices and products will always change and the social norms will change too. And so we will be arguing forever about the latest corporate scandal and whether it counts as a fraud. And we've been arguing about that for longer than you might think. Um, one of the cases that, that, that uh, conceived the idea of badges of fraud was a case from the Elizabethan era called Twins Case or Twines Case. And in that case, the famous Edward Cook, Lord Cook, was the uh, Queen Elizabeth's attorney general. And in reporting the case, he said, if you ask why there are so many laws, this is in 1601, the answer is that fraud ever increases on this earth. OK, I'd love to take a few questions if we have time. We have three minutes. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Oh, that one's a flagrant. I mean, that, that's. <laughs> Theranos, Theranos is the Silicon Valley equivalent of a Ponzi scheme. 
I mean, that is a, and Bad Blood, if you've read it, is a phenomenal book. And we had John Carreyrou who wrote Bad Blood and, and is a character in the book. I mean, one of the, it's one of my favorite corporate crime books now because he writes it so brilliantly. For the first half of the book, he's telling it the way these books are normally written. And then all of a sudden, he becomes a player in the story in this really important way. Um, Carrie Rue, um, thanks to my wife, actually, who runs our law and entrepreneurship program and is very interested in the case from that perspective, uh, brought John Carrie Rue to Duke last year. And we were able to sit with him and ask him questions um, with students about, about the Theranos case. Now, one of the questions I asked John Carrie Rue, I said, look, Elizabeth Holmes is going to go to trial, probably. I mean, she's going to have to. They're not going to offer a very favorable deal to her. So there's always a defense. What's going to be the defense? And, and he said, you know, the defense is going to be the culture in Silicon Valley is fake it till you make it. And I, maybe I knew that the product wasn't as ready as I was saying it was. But that's the way you act in that market. And I did believe that eventually it was going to work. Now, if you read Bad Blood, it's hard to see where she gets the material to make that argument. But I think that's her lawyers will try. Yeah, Marcus. Right. So, to what extent do you think that these fraud convictions are based on kind of political? Oh, there's definitely a, a you know, I, I don't know about the convictions as much as the decisions to prosecute. I think the decision to prosecute, absolutely. I mean, there's sort of this old thing about like, there's some metaphor that I never quite get right about. You know, when you have a recession, the tide recedes and you find all the things that were like lying, you know, at the bottom um, that you wouldn't have seen otherwise, you know, uh, and then the prosecutor. So it's, it, you know, Enron happened because the tech bubble burst in part. WorldCom happened in part, you know. The comp things have to go badly for the prosecutors to, to, to pay attention, right? Um, and that can, and people have to get hurt for them to care enough. Um, but I have to tell you, I am a believer in the, uh, you know, at least in well-tried cases in federal court with good lawyering, which you mostly have in these cases. Um, the sort of juries want to, uh, you know, get bankers and they can't get a fair trial thing really falls apart. I mean, I was on sabbatical in the spring. I mentioned I might write something about the LIBOR case. One of the things while I did on sabbatical, which is something I hadn't done since I was in practice, was I read several very long trial transcripts. So I read weeks of trial transcripts in the LIBOR prosecutions, in the FX currency trading prosecutions, and in one, uh, and, and also actually in the Torre Abacus case, I read the entire trial transcript. Um, I was blown away by the extent to which the lawyers were able to clearly get everybody in those courtrooms focused on what actually happened. Um, and the, their juries have gone both ways in these cases. And so I think, you know, ultimately, not every time, but most of the time, good lawyering, especially if they slow the train down, which defense lawyers almost always are able to do in these cases, and it goes to trial a couple years later when things have kind of cooled down, and you have a nice long two, three, four week trial where you really immerse these jurors um, in the realities of the market, and you show them a human being sitting there the entire time whose life is going to be affected by their decision. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're going to do the right thing. And I think prosecutors know that, actually. And that's one of the reasons why at least good experienced prosecutors like the Southern District of New York, they know that. And that's one of the reasons why Preet Bharara, for example, when he was US attorney in, in Manhattan, I believe, although he'll probably never say this, um, decided to put his resources into all those insider trading cases in the hedge fund industry and not into going after Lehman Brothers because he was thinking, what kinds of cases are actually going to work for me in the long run with juries? Because I've got limited resources, and I do not want to throw half my office at some you know, white whale that at the end of the day, everyone's going to walk away because the jury's going to say, you know what? This stuff is actually complicated, and I'm not sure this guy thought he was doing anything wrong. Yeah, I'm, I'm relying on someone else to tell us when we're out of time. Yeah. OK. Yeah. They weren't able to use that as any precedent because they said, you know, the market's adapted. It's learned mostly because of that previous case. And now that doesn't really hold anymore because the market flies up. So it's a different set of circumstances. Well, I mean, I can't give you an example that fits off the top of my head in exactly what you're saying. But I think you're onto something critical, right, which I've actually written about in my work on fraud. And I alluded to it at the end of my talk. 
which is that one of the things that's so fascinating about fraud is that it's an evolving behavior shooting at a moving target, right? So you, people often say, look, this is criminal law. I mean, for goodness sakes, we shouldn't be locking people up if there's any doubt here at all. Let's just have clear, bright, bright, bright line rules. Either you can trade ahead of the client in the Chicago commodities market or you can't. Um, until the rule says you can't, you don't go to prison if you do it. The problem with that is every time you make a new rule, the behavior is just going to change, right? I mean, the definition of fraud basically is that it is uh, creative ways to get people's money uh, doing things that uh, you wouldn't, uh, you know, that if you did them in a more basic way, you know you'd get caught, right? So, I mean, I like to think about fraud as basically just an outgrowth of the development of the law of theft. You know, for a long time, there was no criminal fraud law. We didn't have it in this country until about the 19th century, and you can't find it in England much before that. But what you can find is the development of theft law. First, the idea of just taking people's stuff right from their bodies. Then theft by false pretenses, embezzlement. You know, the law kind of develops as, as economies and markets develop. The law develops these new ideas of like, well, there's these other ways that people are taking each other's stuff, and we need law that, that's flexible enough to deal with that. And ultimately, what we end up with is this idea about fraud and don't commit fraud, which works as kind of an all-purpose, you know, we haven't seen it yet, but we're going to know it when we see it, that it fits this. And it's very interesting that in, um, I think, 2006, the parliament in the United Kingdom overhauled their um, criminal fraud laws. And basically, um, because they'd had a series of corporate scandals that had kind of fallen into the gaps in their criminal law, they had to try to deal with things like accounting fraud through theft statutes, and it just didn't work doctrinally. They adopted a very broad anti-fraud law in England the Fraud Act of, I think it's 2006, which looks a whole lot like our Rule 10b-5. <laughs> it basically says, now that I just spent a semester in London um, on sabbatical, and I can tell you that the, no one over there is going to tell us ever, oh, we got the idea from you guys. We got it from the Americans. But they kind of did, I think. <laughs> I think that we're probably out of time. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, uh, Professor Bill. You're welcome. Uh, My pleasure.